Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by Arc. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by Arc or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by Arc to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI. This is Simon, one of ARC's analysts focused on the genomic revolution. This week, we're speaking to Dr. Mark Lewis, who is the Director of Gastrointestinal Oncology for the entirety of the Intermountain Healthcare System, which spans across 24 hospitals and includes over 2,400 physicians in the U.S. Mountain Time Zone. Mark is a published author, a practicing physician, and most importantly, a patient. You see, in in Mark's family, there is a history of hereditary cancer predisposition, which resulted in his diagnosis with a neuroendocrine tumor uh, at the very beginning of his career, which helped to shape some of his research interests as well as guide the way that he interacts uh, with his patients with uh, a lot of empathy and focus on, uh, on their experience. So Mark gives a really great perspective from someone who is a practicing uh, and research physician, as well as someone who speaks as a, uh, a patient first and a physician second. Mark, where I wanted to, to start us off here is talking a little bit more about you and, and your family and your history leading up to becoming an oncologist yourself and, and how you came to find out that you had a, uh, a predisposition uh, to cancer. Certainly, I'm more than happy to talk about that, Simon. Thank you. So one thing that might interest your audience, and I know we'll get into how we diagnose cancer broadly, is I got into this field somewhat obliquely through an incidental finding. So we can talk about the merits of screening. One of the things that we try to avoid, though, in cancer is finding the diagnosis too late to cure the patient. And that's actually what happened to my father. So the circumstances were we were immigrating from Scotland to Texas. And one of the public health measures of coming to this country is you require a chest X-ray, which for most people is not a standard screening technique. Here it's done to make sure that you're not bringing tuberculosis to the American public. So we get a call, uh, a very cold call from the embassy saying your father doesn't have tuberculosis but he does have a mass occupying almost entirely his entire right lung. So when we arrived in this country, we immediately had to engage healthcare, um, essentially dealing with an already advanced thoracic malignancy. And uh, my father required surgery to remove the entire lung. Uh, That was ineffective at uh, completely excising it. So there was some residual disease in his chest to which he required radiation. Uh, That didn't entirely respond. He metastasized, required chemo, and then passed away. So that was my entree to oncology is, you know, losing my dad at a a relatively young age. His oncologist took me under his wing, and I worked in his clinic every summer uh, in high school and college and really cultivated an interest in oncology and knew this is what I wanted to do for a living. And then as I was starting my fellowship in oncology, literally the first day, I developed significant abdominal pain. In the process of working that out, found that I had high calcium. And I had my eureka moment because my father had suffered from that too. So what I'm getting at here is there are these patterns that we can see in medicine and family sometimes. And it's almost like staring at the stars and a constellation appears to you. And that's what happened to me that day was I could see now this was not just something sporadic, meaning bad luck that happened to my dad. It was actually something that has been passed down in my family, as best I can tell now, for at least four generations working backwards and forwards. So I've seen my entire career, literally since day one, through the prism of both a patient and a physician. You know, because I have a germline defect, uh, I will be prone to various cancers my entire life. Um, So I've sort of undertaken the process of secondary prevention. So knowing that I'm at higher risk and then undergoing certain interventions, so far just surgeries, uh, when need be. Uh, And that's really affected how I think about my patients and mitigation of their risk. Uh, 
So we can talk again in more general terms about what the sort of trajectory of a cancer patient looks like. I, I'm not fond of the word journey. Journey sounds like something you do voluntarily and maybe for fun. Uh, but I will say there's a longitudinal course going from you know, pre-cancer to very early stage to metastatic, at least with solid tumors. And the real question is, where do you intervene for maximum benefit and minimum risk? Right. So, and I, I don't know what uh, range of years this was, but when you, you know, after you, you started and you said you, you had abdominal pain, was that, you know, obviously you see the pattern there, but do you think kind of reflexing um, nowadays to maybe this is like a, 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 an inherited genetic condition, is that something that is, you think is more common amongst doctors now where they kind of think about that just be, as genetics has become more mainstream, or do you think there's still friction to having that, that thought? I, I think there's still friction. And, and again, um, we have to remember where these diagnoses are often being made. So in my case, I was having fairly acute abdominal pain and required urgent or emergent imaging to work that up. And usually those are going to be interpreted. And I think this is important for our discussion to kind of make people realize where these results come from and how they get filtered through the system. They're usually going to be encountered first by a primary care physician um, who is charged with population health or uh, in an emergent setting uh, by like an urgent care doctor or an urgent care physician. And I'm, I'm actually married to a pediatric urgent care physician, so I have a lot of respect for what they do. But the analogy I've heard, Simon, which I think really resonates with me, is imagine you're standing by a train track and a, and a train is going by very quickly, and all you can see is faces flashing in the window, and you have to pick out the one person that's sick. That's sort of their charge, and it's extremely difficult to do, especially um, in a high-throughput practice or an emergent setting. And the other thing is it's very uncommon in those settings that you have the time to take a detailed family history. Again, I have the utmost respect for my dad's oncologist, but he didn't see in my father that this was a hereditary tumor syndrome. He thought it was just misfortune. And so even oncologists, to be honest with you, are having to be conditioned to think more about um, germline defects. And, and I think with our patients, too, we have to be very clear the differences between mutations in the tumor and mutations in them that are transmissible to their family. There's actually a lot of conversation that goes on there just so we're crystal clear. Just yesterday, in fact, I saw a patient in clinic who was terrified that his new onset pancreatic adenocarcinoma was going to be transmitted to his children. And so we had a long talk about mutations that are present in his tumor that are not going to be uh, passed on to future generations. Yeah, that's one of the things that I've, I've sort of thought about in the context of like, you know, a lot of this stuff is very difficult to understand. I mean, to your point, like the difference between a germline, a hereditary mutation and a sporadic, you know, somatic one. Another way to think about it is we had an interesting thing happen, I think, back in roughly 2006, where we had this this first wave of direct to consumer genetics. I think back then we were in a scenario where there was a huge gap between what was being promised and what was technologically possible at the time. Yeah. And what I am concerned about is the fact that, you know, I believe that genetics and our ability to translate that into meaningful changes in patient care has grown exponentially in the past 15 years and will continue you know, along that trajectory. Right. But the, the uh, anxiety and maybe even the mistrust of the under-promising, or excuse me, the, the over-promising and under-delivering from a few years ago. I'm, I'm concerned about that for two reasons. One, you know, and I think you're, you're a big advocate of, well, actually patients <laughs> kind of being their own self-advocate and, and taking on some of the responsibility, especially in a high-throughput setting. And so maybe to kind of meander this into, into something, you know, more specific is like, how do you think we get over that hesitation uh, and that possibly that mistrust in those murky waters that happened a, a little while ago and move towards a point where we can say, OK, this is getting more real now. And, and it may be a way to kind of parse out uh, the diagnostic funnel, if you will, at the beginning. So we can focus on, you know, folks that do have that, that predisposition, as you pointed out. Yeah, I'll say a couple of things, one of which is I often tell my patients that if I treated them the way I was trained to treat them during my fellowship, that it would be malpractice because the field looks different uh, almost year by year now. And so uh, you're right, past is prologue, but you know some of the precedent there, thankfully, um, we, can, we can assure them that things have gotten better. 
The other thing I'll say is I'm not sure I would have agreed to this recording if I knew you'd previously interviewed Bert Vogelstein, because I am certainly not on his level. Uh, but I listened to your interview with him, and I thought he was right on the money in the sense that we need to be extremely candid with our patients, and frankly, anyone ordering these tests we're talking about, you know, about their performance characteristics from a biostatistical perspective. It's really difficult uh, for, and I'm not trying to be condescending, but I think it's true, uh, for most uh, you know, patients who would be contemplating testing to understand things like sensitivity, specificity, and positive negative predictive value. And I think there's a, almost an assumption that these tests are going to be perfect right out of the box, and they're not. But I think Dr. Vogelstein's point, which I also agree with, is that you know, perfect can be the enemy of the good uh, if we're going to be under diagnosing people by not using these these assays. And so I think, you know, as with chemotherapy, I, I just, I think we owe these people our candor. You know, one of the things I do as a medical oncologist, which is perhaps the hardest sell in medicine, I think, is giving people chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting. So meaning that they've had hopefully a curative surgery, typically of say a colon cancer, but let's say that colon cancer involved lymph, lymph nodes, so now it's stage three. And we know that a certain proportion of those patients will benefit uh, from treatment with chemotherapy. We also know a proportion are going to be overtreated. So I've called it the trolley problem. You know, I encountered that when I was learning ethics back in college. And, you know, this notion that you might have to hurt one person to help many others, that has really weighed on my conscience my entire career. And so what I'm getting at here is both in the therapies that I choose in settings like that where I'm trying to detect, you know, microscopic residual disease, and even in how we explain the ability of these tests to pick up cancer at an early and hopefully more curative stage, we just, we have to be intellectually honest. And you're right, it, when, especially if it's a commercial assay, it is going to be in the best interest of its you know, inventor to sort of, you know, really promote the good parts and undersell the less good parts. And here I'm thinking about, you know, like positive predictive value, I think is is poorly understood even by some clinicians. And I think some of the concern in oncology around these new tests is um, getting a, a signal that either reassures the patient that they uh, don't have cancer when they do, or alarms the patient that they have cancer when they don't. Uh, particularly when you get things like tissue of origin and the limited ability we have to sometimes to localize these tumors. I think one thing we can talk about is Often I hear these you know, liquid biopsies discussed as if they're completely divorced from everything else we do diagnostically. And I think the only way forward, frankly, is going to be some you know, more perfect union of those things. Um, there's a lot of talk about how we marry whole body imaging to these tests when they are you know, alarmingly positive. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. That's at least our sort of existing paradigm and how we work up a patient when we have suspicion of cancer. Yeah, I think, and I think one of the reasons, to your point, why that happens is there are so many different stakeholders in that chain, and there's always been, I think, in healthcare, uh, you know, seemingly different groups kind of being at odds. And in this case, you have, you know, in many, in many times, uh, in many cases, companies that are developing these assays commercially, um, physicians and clinicians, which are the users, um, and then you know, patients, obviously, and then the investment community, and they all want to hear different things and. You know, so it does definitely get a little bit murky. And I, I think before we get too far away from it, I, I wanted to um, to discuss a, a point you made, and then I'd, I'd love to resume on the liquid biopsy discussion. Uh, and, and they're kind of tied together, but essentially, how do you stay current, right? You so see, you, you pointed out, you, you know, that <laughs> you go a year and it's like, okay, there's all of a sudden, you know, things are out of date. And that pace is only accelerating. And so I think an important an important thing to talk about is, you know, what can we do as investors? What can um, patients and clinicians do? And, and most importantly, given that the, the burden of innovation is increasingly falling on companies, what are some characteristics that, that when you see how they're presenting data, how they're contributing to open source research, et cetera, et cetera, what, what would you use to kind of differentiate a good actor from a bad actor in the commercial space? So I'm, I'm well aware that I'm a target market, um, and I often say oncologists are faced with sort of a torrent of information streams. First and foremost, there is an avalanche of data now coming from our patients. It, a typical you know, next generation sequencing report, at least at my institution, might number up to 30 pages. And again, I have the luxury here of having protected time in sort of a pseudo-academic setting where I'm allowed to spend more time per patient 
and also to spend a considerable amount of my time, to your point, absorbing the other information stream, which is this deluge of new findings. And it's so exciting. Like last weekend had you know, sort of the big conference of the year of updates in gastrointestinal oncology, ASCO GI. And I basically had to spend all last weekend largely on Twitter um, absorbing uh, new findings. Um, and it's funny, I'll just diverge very briefly into social media. Uh, in my career, I've seen it go from something considered frivolous uh, or even unprofessional for an oncologist to do to now almost almost mandatory or at least strongly advised to keep up with the literature. And what you see is almost a meta conversation. So unfortunately, a lot of our really important studies, the most rigorously conducted ones, might still be behind paywalls that are largely inaccessible to patients and sometimes even inaccessible to clinicians. So for better or for worse, um, you often have to uh, learn from abstracts, which is not ideal, um, or, and I think this is better, um, still sort of exercise the notion of peer review, which has always been key to our literature and I hope always will, but in how your um, colleagues are interpreting new findings. So one thing I'll say, and obviously this gets into the whole notion of key opinion leaders and are they easily exploited by companies who are looking to you know, sort of get you know, intellectual purchase. Um, but there are people who spend their entire careers studying you know, particular types of cancer. And one thing I want to make clear to your audience is that oncology is now so broad. It, there's no doctor I know, and I know some brilliant clinicians. There's no doctor I know that knows everything about cancer. I think it's impossible now. Um, if you go to the PubMed um, index, I think there's something like 200,000 new articles published per year in cancer alone. Um, which is obviously a huge body of work that no one can fully absorb. Not all those articles are equal merit, of course. So when you're you're asking me how I sort out good actors and bad actors, that I also say I have to set, uh, sort out good evidence and less ready for prime time evidence. And and one thing that happens at these conferences, which is both good and bad, is patients are listening. And you're right. I love the self advocating patient. Um, I like to think I am one myself. I think it's an incredibly important force in healthcare. But one thing that happens, especially in diseases with poor prognoses, like, say, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, is it's understandable that there's a balance there between hope and hype. And we have to be very, very careful, especially when we're dealing with early phase work, uh, not to, as you said earlier, overpromise and underdeliver. The field is unfortunately littered with trials that look super promising in phase one and phase two and then fail to deliver in phase three. So one thing I'm always cautious about, Simon, is making sure that you know, the randomized controlled trial uh, is still the gold standard of evidence-based medicine. It's not always possible. And sometimes we do actually go after things that are biologically plausible, even when we don't have, a, a, say, a massive RCT. And colonoscopy, which you also discussed with Dr. Bogelstein, is, is a perfect um, example. But, you know, you can generally tell, it's almost a gestalt, if you're being marketed information that is not entirely evidentiary, uh, the phrase I hate, well, there's a couple of phrases I hate, one of which is that when I say or hear people say no meaningful toxicity. Um, that is almost always a marker of, of sophistry, because when you look at no meaningful toxicity, it's usually lists of side effects that you yourself would almost certainly not want to incur. So that that always gives me pause when I hear that phrase. And the other one I don't like is statistically insignificant, but clinically meaningful. Um, which generally means someone has been playing around with their a priori statistics and trying desperately to salvage, say, a meaningful p-value or hazard ratio uh, out of data that ultimately was not that compelling. So I guess I want to answer your question, but A, to stay up to date, I rely still on my peers and on social media. And uh, B, most oncologists uh, have a long track record of interacting with industry, and I think that's not a bad thing. I think that's actually really important uh, to see progress, but I think we also know when we are being sold a bill of goods. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, I think it's great when there is a, a collaboration there. And if I could throw one more hated phrase into the basket, these results should replicate in the intended use population. Is another <laughs> one that, that I've I've been frustrated with. And, and to your point, right? Like you know, you brought up two really good examples from therapy where you're actually taking you know a new chemical into your body, and there's you know the 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 like very obvious repercussions that you it could be toxic for you. But I think, and, and this actually goes into a point you were, you were making, and we can get on, you know, back on this discussion about screening, is um, diagnostics, you know, people like to think about that and say, oh, well, it's just a test, right? It can't hurt me. But I, I feel the opposite is true. I feel there is tremendous 
risk for harm in screening. But at the same time, there's tremendous you know, ability for good. And, and I think you know, we just need to kind of weigh those two things together. And I think a lot of people are very excited right now about this idea that within, let's say, conservatively, the next uh, four years, three, four years, we could be at a point where we will have a new tool you know, in your toolkit, uh, which is the ability to screen for multiple cancers at the same time, um, solid tumors and liquid you know, as many as 50, but, you know, obviously these things are, are always uh, under development. So, you know, I think we're in a really critical time period in evidence building. You know, I think there are stories, you know, Dr. Ver, uh, Vogelstein mentioned a few about how um, oncologists have been burned before with bodies of evidence around certain screening tests that didn't really pan out in practice. Just to harken back to something we talked about at the very beginning, which was what happened with direct-to-consumer genetics. And if, um, you know, a, a lasting sort of loss of faith from patients and doctors alike about the technology, I worry about that because I do believe that this could be a really meaningful new tool that we have for preventing the emergence of later stage disease. So what I'm really trying to drive at here is as these companies continue to run larger clinical trials and put out evidence, from your perspective, what are, what are the most critical but not obvious things that you would like to see tracked, right? So you mentioned sensitivity, specificity, obviously really important to have your mind around those things. But some of the qualitatives, like we, we talked about, you know, the, the risk of overtreatment and how, how easy it is to marry this cutting edge tech with traditional diagnostic workflows. So maybe some of those things would be, would be interesting and I think important uh, for us to touch on. Well, any good oncologist, Simon, thinks about adverse events. And I think you've, you've touched on something that is potentially intangible, but I would also argue um, if you don't look for it, you're not going to find it, which is psychological harm. So I'll give you an example. One of the diseases I treat that I've already mentioned several times is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, an incredibly deadly disease. 85% of the time when I meet a patient with that diagnosis, and obviously there's some selection bias there, they're incurable. So there's been interest for years now. And, and how do we find that cancer earlier? My form of cancer was pancreatic, but, it, but a different form than the traditional form. So let's put that out there. So I've been very fortunate, I suppose, with that favorable biology. But regardless, you know, the pancreas is buried deep in the abdomen. There's no way to feel it. Um, the only way you can see it is either with an invasive surgery or some form of cross-sectional imaging. And it doesn't make sense from a public health perspective to take, say, CT scans and run them on everybody, uh, you know, in the same way we might offer you know, pap smears and mammograms to women and colonoscopies to everybody now above the age of 45. We've struggled with how do we catch the pancreatic cancer earlier when hopefully it's more curable without, to your point, um, alarming people unnecessarily. So I'll give you an example. At ASCO GI a couple of years ago now, there was a really interesting study that looked for um, the canonical mutation in most pancreas cancer, which is KRAS looking for that in the bloodstream and saying, okay, um, let's, let's try to zoom in on people that have this KRAS mutation in circulation and let's see if they have pancreatic cancer. And what I found most alarming about that study was that 4% of the normal controls had a positive signal. So not only would we be exposing some people at least to the needless radiation burden that comes at least with CT scanning, but also the the bell that you can't unring, which is being told, hey, we think you might have you know, this fatal cancer. And I, and I agree with you. That, that's the part that really worries me, is that once you tell someone that you suspect that, you can't undo that. And, and our imaging is not perfect either. So one thing I, I think is over sort of sold about PET scans, PET scans are wonderful. You know, they are, they're a form of technology. They usually rely on radio-labeled sugar, although they don't have to. Uh, so they're not always cancer-specific. And they can pick up all kinds of things that are false positive or at least not malignant. So I, get, I think what we're getting at here together is if you're doing this testing, uh, one of the potential downsides um, in finding a positive, which, which seems, you know, on the face of it, like it would only be a good thing, is the positives are not always meaningful. And you can't always then reassure the patients uh, thereafter that there is or isn't cancer. Because uh, some of these things can live on a cellular level below the resolution of even our best imaging. Some of the liquid biopsies, in fact, sort of sell themselves on this notion that they predate uh, imaging findings of new cancer by something like eight months. And that sounds great. And I think we need to figure out 
therapeutically how we intervene in that time interval. But I can tell you on the flip side, it's also very unnerving for the patient to be told they have this positive, say, molecular signal and nothing that I can find on physical exam or on scans. So that's where we are right now. And I agree with you, this is a pivotal time in development of both these molecular uh, tests and in our imaging. Because ultimately, if we're going to cure these people, either we need incredibly effective systemic therapies or we need to be finding them. We can either surgically remove them or radiate them. That's really been the paradigm to date. Yeah, and it's a good point because what the, the argument you're making, I think, is relevant to two time points along that care continuum, right? So, you know, pre-diagnosis and you can't confirm with imaging. And it's like, well, you know, what do you do? And you alluded to that with the, the ringing of the bell. But also in the in the minimal residual disease setting, which you know we we talk about more, but for folks that you know haven't you know delved into that as deeply, and correct me, but you know essentially you know uh, after you go through an initial surgery and maybe adjuvant chemotherapy or, or radiation, your disease burden, meaning you know quantitatively the amount of cancer in your body, you know hopefully uh, down below a detectable limit, um, where you know you'll be scanning and you won't be able to see anything, and this whole new class of liquid biopsy is to your point, yeah, exactly. Can we detect it, you know, some number of months or years before it would appear, you know, radiographically. But I didn't, I didn't think about that is, is how do you tie that to an outcome, right? right? Is, is, there, is there a differential if we intervene and you can't operate, you can't do chemo? So yeah, that's, that's a really good point. I, th- I, I would hope that more trials kind of think about, okay, well, now what? <laughs> what was the value if you right. can't change management? You did get to bill for it, though. So, I mean, or the company does. So, you know, there's always there's always that layer. So, Simon, can I say two things there? Uh, one is um, one of the thought leaders in our field and arguably the poet laureate of oncology is Siddhartha Mukherjee. And not only has he written amazing books and articles about cancer, he also gave a talk at the biggest oncology meeting of the year, ASCO, a couple of years ago. And he said his big fear with this technology, and it's always stuck with me, is making every person a pre viver meaning that we make every every member of the public think that they are you know antecedent to a cancer diagnosis and, and he was pointing out again the tremendous psychological harms of doing something like that because almost everybody is afraid uh, that if they got cancer they would be seriously ill or even die from it so that stuck with me to your answer about study design some of the more elegant studies i've seen and i won't mention proprietary products again are pairing the signals that you get meaning is there minimal residual disease or is there not? And we're way ahead in liquid malignancies as opposed to solid tumors. But then picking your treatment based on that result. And in fact, that's maturing even in, in colon cancer, which is really exciting for me and, and makes me think that you know the promise of precision medicine, I think, is going to be in knowing that when I give someone chemo, I really am likely to benefit them, as opposed to right now when, to be honest, and this is kind of scary to say, but it's the truth, we're often guessing. And that's really important to be honest again about that to patients. A lot of patients think that chemo is a completely cut and dry decision. At least in the minimal residual disease space, it is not. Um, The benefit actually is obviously, or more obviously clear in the metastatic setting when you have something that you can quantify, typically on scan, sometimes in blood. Uh, But we don't want our patients to get to that point, right? That's the whole gist of intervening earlier. And that was Dr. Vogelstein's whole point that We've spent so much time, literally, and energy and money on treating late-stage disease, and we still need to do that. That's still really important. But the you know, life years gained would be substantially greater if we could intervene on the prevention end. And there again, actually, there's some really interesting sort of tandem work being done between, say, a liquid biopsy and a traditional screening test like colonoscopy. Um, so again, just last weekend, there was some uh, interesting work um, presented that Um, Liquid biopsies now are getting so good at detecting advanced adenomas, so the growths in the colon that predate uh, an actual cancer. So one of the reasons I've been such a zealot about colon cancer screening, and again, some of my peers don't agree with me about this, and that's okay. Science is is a dialectic, is it makes sense to me that if you do a colonoscopy and you remove a polyp, you have now interrupted the adenoma to carcinoma sequence by which that polyp is going to become a cancer. So I see colonoscopy not just as screening, I actually see it as prevention. And there, arguably, it has more power even than you know other screening tests we think about, like mammography and uh, pap smears or HPV testing now that have been really uh, inculcated into women's health maintenance. So 
I, I've told people for years the colonoscopy argument makes sense to me, even though I cannot show you a randomized controlled trial that you know if you do colonoscopies on this hundred thousand people and then you wait five years and do it on this hundred thousand people, that there's a survival difference. We've actually known that for a while in flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is a camera that only goes into the kind of lower part of the colon. And I've often thought, well, if the signal is there, it stands to reason, if not yet a massive amount of evidence that colonoscopy would carry a similar survival benefit. What I'm really getting at here, though, is right now the age-based approach still doesn't sit well with me because the American Cancer Society and the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force are now harmonized that we should be doing colon cancer screening in some method, at least, starting age 45. And, and the recognition there is that there's younger and younger people that are dying from colon cancer. And believe me, I hate to see that in my practice. I, you know, one of the things I say is I, you know, the, the, the medical oncologist is the last person that should ever see someone with colon cancer because this seems like a disease that we should be able to intervene on earlier. But the 45-year-old you know, age threshold um, can seem very arbitrary when you're seeing someone in your clinic who's 44 and dealing with you know, a stage four disease. So what I'm getting at is there may be a way here, and I don't have all the answers, but to pair you know, non-invasive testing um, with the identification of um, high-risk populations that should be screened earlier. And how we implement that is obviously a huge problem to solve. Do you do it at the primary care level? Do you do it on the oncologist level? Do you do it at the gastroenterologist level? I mean, this is going to vary, I think, by disease. The primary care doctors, I will say, have the very unenviable task of selling screening to a vast population. Uh, but then when there's a positive result, it usually comes to oncology. So on the oncology side, the, the, the part that we don't want is we don't want this massive burden of positive tests, or at least false positive tests, coming to us. Already, there's something called the silver tsunami which basically is acknowledging that cancer is only going to get worse as the population ages. Cancer is largely a disease of, of senescence. And already the oncology workforce, if I'm honest, is strained. There are not enough of us to take care of most of the cancer. And we worry about the sort of coming storm of more and more cancer that we can't handle. So in that setting, the last thing that we want is more, more positive tests. So there's this weird tension between science and implementation. And, and again, when there's a new conference like the one we just had, I, I warn my patients, there could be a gulf here between what you just heard, which sounds wonderful, and my ability to offer it to you. Right. You know, to, to one of your points, I, I have I have a similar frustration in the sense that, you know, w we use age as a, as a proxy for incidents, like you said, because it's a, it's a disease that, that correlates to, to age to some extent. But at the same time, and we've talked about this even in this conversation is the, the other the other variable is your predisposition defined by your genetics, right? right. It's a double axis. And and you should be able to operationalize that. I mean, someone who is 25 may have a higher risk than someone who's 60, depending on what's happening in their inherited genome. Agreed. Right. So, so so I think both of those increasingly should be used to define and draw lines around who is to be screened and how often. Especially now that the, the you know, the, I think a really interesting thing that is starting to emerge is that when you have a, let's say, a, a company or a lab that has the ability to kind of horizontally integrate these different tests and not just, you know, in a way where it looks like they have a catalog, but to squeeze them together into a single service where the information flow from your inherited genome is actually informative of the screening interval or the onset date. And it's like, we're still a ways away from that level of like, you you know, just thinking about it as a, as a public utility. But I wonder if that might be a way to kind of combat the overstraining effect to some extent. Right. And, and obviously some people would, you know, look at that vision, which I personally, I agree with you. I think there's potential huge public health benefit and say, well, that's brave new world. We're, we're taking people and we're you know, classifying them basically by their, you know, fitness. But yeah, I, I agree with you. One other thing I want to make clear to your audience, and this is somewhat shameful, is our electronic medical records are pretty woeful uh, in the interoperability of this kind of genetic and genomic information. Oftentimes, they get buried in a PDF, um, which is you know, scanned in somewhere in the system, and it's really difficult sometimes to to find it and you know act upon it. So we're also you know a huge part of this, I think, is the data infrastructure. Because again, you're typically talking about massive amounts of information, and obviously, you know, with Moore's law, um, I think it explains a lot of the 
sort of exponential growth that you talked about um, earlier. But we really do have a problem in our clinics, at least at the moment, uh, with extracting uh, the information that we need. And I can only imagine how hard that is uh, on the patient side, too. So you're right. One question going forward is, you know, who's the client here? Is it the, is it the physician? And if so, which one? Primary care or is it some subspecialty like an oncologist? Is it the patient themselves that is so self-advocating that they want to, you know, order this and, and find out their or their children's, um, you know, medical future? And I will say, I'll just speak here very briefly and personally as a parent. So I mentioned earlier the disease in my family is passed from generation to generation. So I can track it back to my paternal grandfather. That's kind of as far as I can see. And then I have uh, given it to my son. So you know, as a parent, you know, I know he carries this genetic predisposition. In some ways, I think he's more fortunate than any of the other men that preceded him in our family because we can treat him with that foresight. And hopefully it's not too psychologically burdensome on him. Um, we told him fairly early on. So it seems to him almost like uh, part of his normal uh, childhood to be you know, tested in this way. But I know not everyone's ready for that. And so, again, I don't, I don't have all the answers for you. I don't know if anyone does, but I, I agree with you that I think the future of medicine is going to be uh, genomically informed. There are certain diseases that we screen for at birth uh, that have profound uh, hereditary implications, um, but we don't yet screen for everything. Uh, and there are some diseases you might not want to know that you have. Huntington's disease is the classic example and a horrific form of neuromuscular degeneration that is almost invariably fatal. So yeah, that's um, that's the challenge. Is uh, it's great to have the science. Uh, we're still figuring out how to use it for a maximum benefit and minimal harm. Yeah, and and on the psychology element, I, I had an interesting point that was made in, in another podcast that that we did with a, a company called Freeno. Um, but we looked at and thought about the psychology of, of ordering these screens to some extent for patients is is neutral, right? The best outcome being neutral, like you you. You, I mean, look at it this way. Most people don't have cancer. Right. So when you get this test, you expect that it would be healthy. And uh, even if it is healthy, you know that there's still some room for error. No test is perfect. So it didn't quite squash the anxiety, if that's what you were worried about. Um, or it could be the worst news of your life, right? And, and even worse than that is, um, you know, starting what could be a, a wild goose chase if it was a false positive. Thinking critically about the underlying psychology and the importance of things like user interface and and just kind of coaching and shepherding and thinking about, you know, I know we used the word journey and kind of moved on past that, um, but really thinking about it, uh, I, I feel like that's an understudied part of the diagnostic framework, especially for companies that have been used to test by test by test and not really thinking about it that way. Yeah, it's funny, and that's that's really well observed. I, I hadn't thought about it that way myself. You know, on the one hand, it strikes me that there's going to have to be some significant, you know, automation and digitization of how we do this, because like I said, the, our workforce is already strained. And it's not like, oh, you know, the poor doctors, we are well compensated for what we do, but it also takes a long time to train us. <laughs> and, you know, during COVID, you know, some of us have said, you know, quite strenuously, hey, listen, we're not, uh, you know, an easily renewable resource probably takes you know, a decade or more, uh, sometimes a postgraduate training to you know, train a doc. But my other point, and it's a little touchy-feely, is that some of these discussions you know, really get at the core encounter of medicine, which is one person talking to the other. And a lot of people you know, ask me, you know, you know, how, do you, how do you do oncology? Isn't it so depressing? And, and the answer is, well, yeah, there's, there's sad things that happen to my patients all the time, unfortunately, but that, that core encounter is still so rewarding. And I, I don't want to see that entirely go away. And sometimes to really understand and convey risk to a patient, you have to talk to them. That's the part I'm struggling with, is this growing imbalance between the number of conversations we need to have and the number of conversations we can have. And that's where I worry about how tests like the ones we're discussing get rolled out, um, because they have enormous potential for harm, or to your point, they, they can be actually really reassuring, but the patient needs to know going in uh, what it is that they're signing up for. And also, too, like this is something I've heard. I don't know if you share this opinion as well, but it, it, when you talked about kind of the length of time it takes to train um, a clinician, um, the increasing use of kind of, um, you know, artificial intelligence and computation, right? This is a, a fantastically powerful and versatile tool and is the backbone for a lot of these, say, next generation diagnostics. 
But I agree with you that at the end of the day, you're still going to be administering medicine in person and the human relationship is extremely important and should probably stay at the center of that practice. So from your perspective, how do you think about the increasing reliance on AI in healthcare, whether it's, you know, maybe let's not say general purpose AI where, you know, you have something speaking to you about how to do your job, <laughs> but <laughs> more about, um, you know, this is the right treatment based on this deluge of information. I mean, the 200,000 papers that you didn't have time to read or, or look at. Is there a, 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 a mistrust or, or just a, like a, a healthy level of skepticism or caution? Or, or how do you think, especially the next 20 years of clinicians who are going to grow up with this exposure, how do you think that might change? Yeah, so I'll, I'll say a couple of things. So probably in medicine, there, there are some specialties in particular where the whole crux of the profession is data processing. So radiology is a perfect example. Uh, pathology, I think, is another one. These are um, positions who uh, have less patient contact than the rest of us, sometimes no patient contact. And they're a little bit worried that these computer programs are going to come along and, and replace them. But what I would say there is I think we have a long way to go before that would happen. And also, there have been some real false starts, uh, even in oncology, asking AI to sort of process all the information that we give it. And, you know, and sometimes you can argue it's garbage in, garbage out. We don't necessarily give the, um, the computer everything that it would need to make uh, the correct clinical decision. But the other thing, and I can send you this, uh, and we can link to it maybe in the description of your episode, there's a really chilling essay written a couple of years ago now in the Journal of Clinical Oncology that basically looks at this question. And it's a five-minute encounter between a patient and a computer where the computer is just sort of spitting out data and tells the patient, you know, they have an 87% chance of mortality at one year. And, you know, it just, it just struck me cold. And uh, you, you and I, I think, share an interest in science fiction, but this one really seemed like it's something that could become reality if we're not very careful. So again, without sounding like I'm promoting my own job security, I still think there's a human element here, both in conveying information and also really in getting the gestalt of the patient. Uh, the last thing I might say is there's a phrase in oncology that may or may not be familiar to your audience. It's called performance status. And it really comes down to an eyeball test by the oncologist of how fit uh, is the patient and how likely are they to benefit from chemotherapy. And, and the, the basic principle is the better your performance status, the less likely we are to harm you with chemo. The worse your performance status, the more are, are likely we are to, to render you, you know, debilitated and bed bound and actually hasten your demise. And, and there is some evidence emerging that uh, computers ultimately might be better at that than we are. Um, but so far, that actually is still a huge part of how we select patients' sort of eligibility for treatment and enroll them in clinical trials. So I would not uh, yet um, sort of excise uh, oncologic evaluation from this, uh, from this process. And but before we wrap up, I just wanted to to maybe touch on something. You know, I I, I do want to ask because you you mentioned uh, you know being back, let's say in med school or in your residency, and thinking about what types of technologies you might have you know later or where you are in your career right now. But if we were to kind of redo that cycle and and say, okay, well, what are you what are you what types of tools are you excited to have or possibly have by the end of um, let's say the end of the twenty twenties. Yeah. What, what are some what are some uh, some ideas that come to mind? The biggest one that immediately springs to mind because we're getting close to it already is how we select people for the adjuvant therapy I mentioned earlier. How do we pick people without traditionally measurable disease and know that it's right to give them chemotherapy? Because as I said earlier, no one should want chemotherapy ever. The, the whole goal as an oncologist is to counsel people uh, into understanding that they might need it and making sure that they have that comprehension before they embark on something potentially toxic. One of the really formative experiences of my fellowship, aside from my own self-diagnosis, was I was about two weeks into training, and a patient who was not mine, belonged to one of the other doctors, came into the hospital, a young woman, with a relatively low-risk breast cancer, all things considered, who then proceeded to die in front of me from uh, chemotherapy that had resulted in uh, impaired immunity, and then she became septic and passed away. And it really struck me. I was like, wow, I, I, I don't know if that woman benefited from chemo. In fact, she almost certainly didn't. Um, and when, when you take the, you know, the broader picture of her life, you know, we probably shortened it. And it really stuck with me. And adjuvant chemo is not something to play with. So in this next decade, I would anticipate that we will become much better at selecting who really requires these treatments and who doesn't. 
I don't know yet if we're ready to do that at extremely early stage or pre-cancer, but I will say there's a, say, a stage three population, uh, which will differ from tumor type to tumor type, where I think that that will become hopefully sort of baked in the standard of care. Right. Well, we'll have to stay in touch as, as that evolves. I know uh, th- this whole year and next year, I, I know there's there's going to be a lot of announcements in the, the minimal residual or MRD space. So we'll, we'll have to stay in touch on that. But, you know, again, thank you for all the time. You've been so generous uh, speaking with us. And uh, I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you, Simon. I really appreciate the chance to talk to your audience. And you're right. This is uh, definitely going to evolve. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.